mature content warning. Time to deworm the Big Apple. This will be a barrel of laughs. Squeal like a pig. Hey everyone, Chris here with another filler video, and we're finishing off our look at the Windows sequels to DOS games with one of my favorite PC platformers of all time, Duke Nukem Manhattan Project. Yes, one of my favorites. In fact, this is my second favorite Duke Nukem game, surpassed only by Duke Nukem 3D. This may come as a surprise to a lot of people for a couple of reasons. Firstly, this game is often considered to be a budget title, especially considering it was following on the trail of Duke Nukem 3D, which had come out several years prior, and is pretty much a step backwards by comparison. But no, this was a full commercial product, although admittedly not a full priced one. I got my copy on discount from $40 for $35, and it was only a few months old by that point. Secondly though, it was a platformer following up as a sequel to a first person shooter, when everyone was already anticipating Duke Nukem Forever. Yeah, DNF was supposed to have been out way earlier, but we all know the development hell that ended up going through. Duke Nukem Manhattan Project was meant to be a sort of tide me over game, originally developed by Sunstorm Interactive and published through Arush Entertainment in 2002. But players didn't want a platformer, they wanted a first person shooter. So combined with the reduced price point, people just didn't buy this thing or saw it as grossly inferior to Duke 3D, thus not worth the time or money. But trust me when I say that as far as run and gun platformers are concerned, this is one of the best ones out there. There's a total of 24 levels, each taking about 10 minutes to complete, thus easily making for a 20 hour plus game. There's no extra lives to worry about. And for all the completionists out there, the save system not only lets you replay any previous levels, but tracks every secret found, every collectible nuke symbol found, and even every single enemy killed, all separated by skill level. Although, for sake of the secret super items that you can acquire, only the nuke symbols matter. We'll go into those later, but yeah, if you want a fully completed file, this can easily take up to 100 hours of gameplay or more. In any case, the game itself revolves around Duke trying to save Manhattan from an evil scientist known as Morphix, who's manufacturing a special substance known as Glop, which can mutate any mundane creature into an anthropomorphic killing machine. Or back again, as luck would have it. Yeah, the plot is pretty much Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but remove every turtle except Raphael, give him a bunch of guns, and put the Technodrome in orbit and BAM, you've got the story for this game. Granted, if you're playing a Duke Nukem game for the story, then you're probably missing the point. Duke Nukem is about moving and shooting, and the gameplay here is spot on. You have controls for moving around, you have both a regular jump and a double jump, you have three different attack buttons, so that you have instant access to whatever gun you have equipped, your pipe bombs, and Duke's mighty foot. And you have buttons to zoom the camera or scroll it around. That's actually another reason why this game may have gone under the radar with some people, because this game does not play well with the keyboard. You really need to be using a controller to get the most out of this game. But the average PC gamer didn't have a controller for their systems back in the early 2000s. Or if they had anything, it would just be a flight stick of some sort, which isn't going to work for something like this. So again, this was another thing keeping this game from really making an impact. One thing you'll notice too is that Duke doesn't have a health meter in this game. The Ego System, founded Duke Nukem Forever, had already been conceived by this point. In fact, it was conceived during development of this game as some of the screenshots used on the back of the box clearly show extra lives in a health level. The idea behind the Ego System is that Duke can't really be hurt physically. He can only have his ego bruised or boosted. There's still traditional med kits to boost ego up, but even killing enemies boosts Duke's ego. The maximum ego is also not a hard maximum, and any boost in ego can push it over this limit. It's just that while ego is over its maximum, it slowly falls back down. This encourages playing the game as fast as possible so as to keep Duke's ego up. 
You also trigger a temporary double damage bonus if you can get Ego up to 250, as well as a full ammo restore if you can get up to 400. Although getting it that high on any skill level other than easy is extraordinarily difficult. Because Ego is so readily restored though, the enemies also have very difficult and fast attacks to deal with. And chances are high you're going to take a hit when dealing with an enemy, but then when you kill them you get some Ego back anyways, so as long as you act fast it still balances itself out pretty well. Now, the goal of each level is to rescue a babe strapped to a glop bomb and also find a key card in order to gain access to the level's exit. Every third level is a little smaller than the normal level sizes, but also has a boss to fight. Now, some of the bosses are actually pretty interesting and entertaining, while some you can literally win by standing still and holding the fire button. Duke's also got a pretty entertaining selection of one-liners as well, although I have to wonder if multiple people were writing them, because some of them are decidedly dukish, like these two. You want to go fight? Fight me! I'm not gonna fight you. I'm gonna kick your ass. I always said if there's a way to go, it would have something to do with women, whips, and oil. But then some of them feel very... not Duke. Hmm, no lights. Must be part of Morphix's energy conservation plan. Ah, uh, I love the smell of sewers in the morning. I bet Morphix is hiding under a turd somewhere. Actually, most of the one-liners are good enough. Here's a few more of the more noteworthy ones. <laughs> Bacon. Bacon. Come on out, Morphix. There's only two ways this can end, and in both of them, you die. The file name for this soundbite actually refers to Dr. Proton from the original game, as they were originally going to use Dr. Proton as the main villain here, but then decided to go with a totally new character. I don't do windows. You must be 18 or older to ride. Wait a minute, does this mean Duke's actually rescuing teenagers? This just hit a new level of skeevy. These colored key cards suck. Hey, just be glad there's only one color per level, Duke. Screenshots on the box suggest that they were gonna have you find all three colors in each level at one point. You're going down faster than the XFL. Son of a bitch! The funny thing about this one, it's actually repeated numerous times in the game's assets with different swears for the file names, suggesting they may have had to cut out the more colorful swears to avoid getting an AO rating from the ESRB. They were a lot more stringent about swearing back then. Time to deliver Max Payne on the A train. Now where'd I put that subway token? Actually, I still have mine, though it's in storage and I wasn't able to find it in time for this video. The game came with a keychain which had the Statue of Liberty on one side and a radiation symbol on the other, and basically made itself out to look like a subway token of sorts. Now, Duke does have an array of weapons to assist him, but the interesting thing here is that they all use one of only three different ammo sources. Bullets, pipe bombs, or glock. Many of the weapons get outdated pretty quickly and are mostly just to conserve ammo if you find yourself running out, as weaker weapons do more damage per ammo used than the stronger weapons, but they do that damage slower. The pipe bombs are also done extremely well. You'd think because you're tossing them at an angle it'd be really hard to aim them, but you don't have to be 100% accurate to hit your mark and you can detonate them at any point in time by pressing the button a second time, so you can easily get these things to go where you want them to. You can also kick stuff. Now this may seem stupid at first because Duke's kick isn't very strong and doesn't have much range, but you get double the ego for killing something with your kick. So doing kicks against weaker enemies is a good way to get ego back since the weakest enemies can often be felled with one or two jump kicks, especially once you get the powered up secret items. Plus this works against bosses too, so doing a kick as your final hit against the boss can easily get you a serious ego boost to start the next level with. Before we talk about these super secret items though, we need to quickly talk about the nukes. Each level has 10 nukes to find, and when you find all 10, all of Duke's maximum stats go up by a small amount, including maximum ego. These increases are very minor but over the course of 24 levels, they can add up pretty substantially. Although some of the hiding places are fairly clever, I was able to find them all on my own accord without using an FAQ back in the early 2000s when I was first playing this game. Now, given the fact that you can replay a level on the same save file as many times as you need to, you never really have to worry about missing them because you can just go back and try again whenever you feel like it. 
And once you beat the game, if you also have all of the nukes, you unlock a special item which you're given access to no matter what skill level you play on from then on. Thus, if you want to make hard mode a little more manageable, getting all the nukes on the easy and normal difficulties can actually make hard mode less of a chore to get through because you'll have those items to help you out. The secret item you get from Easy Skill is a new pair of boots which do double damage, thus allowing you to kick things to death more easily. Normal Skill Reward is a vest which halves all of the damage Duke takes, while the reward for Hard Skill is a new weapon which basically one-shots everything with zero effort, since, well, let's face it, if you can beat the game on hard and get all the nukes, why not get an OP weapon as a reward? There's also a secret boss you can reach after beating the game on hard, which is meant to be near impossible to defeat, let alone get to in the first place, but I've never experienced this boss myself. As for the aesthetic aspects of the game, the graphics are not bad. They're not great, but they're about on par for 3D graphics of the time. The music is... okay. The thing with the music is that all of it is decent enough, but it's all very short loops, so it repeats constantly and can feel like it's droning on at times. The level designs are also fairly well done, with a lot of non-linearity and only minor amounts of backtracking. Though a handful of the levels can feel somewhat maze-like, the oil tanker and sewer levels are the worst offenders for this. But yeah, despite its minor flaws, this is a really fun run-and-gun platformer. It's no Duke 3D by any stretch, but it wasn't trying to be. It was just trying to be its own little thing, and it succeeds at that. If you go into this expecting the kind of depth and gameplay in Duke 3D, you're going to be disappointed. But go into this with the mindset of how you would enjoy the earlier Duke platformers, and this one beats them both hands down. Anyways, let's talk about how to actually obtain this game and get it working. For some time, this game was available on digital download services like GOG and Steam, but due to litigation between Gearbox and 3D Realms, Gearbox gained full ownership of the Duke Nukem license, which in turn led to many of the Duke Nukem games being pulled from these services. I think the 360 version of Manhattan Project is still available on Xbox Live, but the PC version is still MIA. In fact, one of my Patreon supporters, Juan Burbano, once again had a question to ask. Is Gearbox ever going to re-release Duke Nukem 1-2 and Manhattan Project again, or are they still going to remain locked inside a digital vault? Well, the answer is... who knows. The simple fact is that they have nothing to lose and a lot to gain by making these products available again, but many of the licensing details inside the games themselves would be outdated or illegal for them to use without permission. So unless they either changed the original files, or came to some sort of agreement with every party involved, it may never happen. However, Gearbox did do their own 20th anniversary release of Duke Nukem 3D last year, and even the System Shock series is out of litigation limbo now after being stuck in it for nearly two decades. So really, anything's possible. It's just, there's no way to know if it's going to happen tomorrow or ten years from now. My guess is, though, is that if they can ever make it work from a legal standpoint, they'll do it. Thus, for the moment, the best way to get the PC version is secondhand from places like eBay. Since the game wasn't very popular but sold tons of copies, there's a glut of them out there. And you can get used copies for dirt cheap, and even brand new sealed copies tend to only run for about $20. However, if you want a copy which comes with the keychain, that might be a lot harder to find, but the box will specifically state that the keychain is included if it should be in there. So there at least won't be any ambiguity about it. Though be sure to ask the seller if they're using their own photo or a stock photo when you see that. If you happen to have a digital download version, you should be able to get it working flawlessly and effortlessly. In fact, you probably noticed this was the only Windows sequel I got running at 1920x1080 widescreen resolution. Not that some of the previous games couldn't do it either, but they didn't do it well. This one, however, the only thing wonky is that the status bar is stretched. Though if you're playing an original CD release, you also have to adjust the field of view to get it looking right, and this is where things get a little... odd. Firstly, the original CD release and the digital download versions have different launchers. The launcher for the original CD release doesn't work at all on a modern Windows machine, so you'll pretty much have to bypass it entirely and run the prism3d.exe file directly, which is the engine that the game uses. Following this, you'll notice the game is very zoomed in. You need to adjust the field of view to compensate for a widescreen resolution, but there is no FOV option. Well, not in the game anyways. You'll need to open the config.cfg file for the game in the duke backslash base folder and add the line useset 
G underscore cam underscore FOV and put your desired field of view in quotes. The default setting for a standard aspect display is 50, and I found that for a 1080p monitor, the most optimal setting is 60 to get it looking just right. However, after you run the game, quit, and run it again, you're going to notice your FOV change is gone. The way Manhattan Project works is that it always rewrites the save file in its entirety on exit, and the original version of the game doesn't save the FOV details. The way around this is to set up all other pertinent options first while in the game, like the graphics drivers, sound settings, controls, etc., then open the config.cfg file, add the FOV change, close it, then open the file properties and mark it as read only thus preventing the file from ever being overwritten again, and thus preventing your FOV change from being lost. One thing to keep in mind about the FOV, though, is that some levels adjust this on their own accord, meaning even if you set your own FOV in the config file, it's going to get overwritten in some circumstances. There's unfortunately not much you can do about this with the original release of the game, other than just adapt to the fact that some spots are going to be much more zoomed in than they're supposed to be. But there's one other pertinent detail, too. The game supports both Direct3D and OpenGL rendering. Now, you may think Direct3D is the way to go. And you would be wrong, at least with a modern system. Legacy OpenGL compatibility is way better on modern Windows systems than legacy Direct3D support. So you'll get better and more stable frame rates going with OpenGL over Direct3D. Plus, there's a bug with double jumping which may prevent it from working right, and I've noticed that this bug is way more likely to crop up in Direct3D than OpenGL. Though on rare occasions, it can still show up in OpenGL too. But instead of happening every single time you go to jump, it should only happen a few times clustered together about once every half hour or so. However, OpenGL does have a minor rendering glitch with the status bar and the pop-ups on a modern Windows system. But fortunately, the game actually has a fix for this in the config file. Just find the line uset gl underscore ext underscore edge underscore clamp and set the value for it to 1. This should fix your OpenGL rendering woes, though test the game without applying this fix first, just in case it's not a factor on your system. The last thing to mention is that if you intend to use a direct input gamepad with this game, modern Windows systems don't monitor input from direct input devices anymore, thus using such a device will not prevent the system from going into an idle state, potentially triggering screensavers, automatic disk defragmenting, or even automatic updates which may restart the system. This is actually something I should have been mentioning in every one of these videos up to now, because this can trip people up trying to play old games or even new games on modern Windows systems using legacy controllers. I found the best solution to this is to use Joy to Key, a cheap shareware program normally used for mapping joystick devices to keyboard keys. But what you can also do is just map every single joystick function to a keyboard key which has no effect on the game you're playing. For Duke Nukem Manhattan Project, I decided on the Shift key and that should prevent an idle state from occurring while you're playing. Though I have noticed this can screw with some of the mid-level screens, so just make sure to use the keyboard to clear those screens and you should be good. Anywho, that's all for this filler video. I was originally going to end the year here in terms of videos and start things up again with the next regular episode of Ancient DOS Games on Saturday, January 6th, which I am still going to do. But I intend to release one more filler video just prior to talk about some things which have cropped up these past couple months. So make sure to stay tuned for that. The update filler is going to go live on Saturday, December 30th. I'll also be revealing the hint for episode 226 of Ancient DOS Games at that time. End of the line. Last stop, total destruction. Thanks for watching everyone, and special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's a small random set of you guys. I could do this all day.
it's time to deliver Max. <clears throat> Practicing my Duke voice when the trains are going by. <laughs> it's time to deliver Max Payne on the A train. Now, where'd I put that subway token? These colored key cards suck. Come on out, Morphix. There's only two ways this can end, and in both of them, you die. Damn, those alien bastards are gonna pay for shooting up my ride. These trains suck. Hey, if the train's passing by, I'll do whatever voices I want. <laughs> I just want to do my voice work, not get interrupted every five minutes by a freaking train. How's my Duke voice? Call 1-800-I-DON'T-CARE.